So what made you become interested in meteorites? Why meteorites? It's a funny story. I wound up going to MIT mostly because I had a friend there and it looked like an exciting place to go. But I wanted to figure out what I could major in. I had been a history major. I had been studying history. I was thinking of being a journalist. He showed me the world's largest collection of science fiction, and that convinced me I had to be there. But I was looking for a major, and I found one that said Earth and Planetary Science. That's a planet, so it's like astronomy. So I chose that. Only when I arrived, I found out that I had volunteered to be in the geology department. And you know, it could be more boring than rocks, until I discovered rocks that fall out of the sky. And the idea that you can actually touch a piece of outer space was so exciting to me. And, and the fact that there was a marvelous instructor who, who would get you excited so you'd wake up on Tuesday morning and say, I get to go to the class on meteorites today. That's all. And ever since then, I've just been fascinated with using the things I did learn in geology, which turned out to be a lot more fascinating than just looking at rocks, and using them to try to understand the places where the rocks come from. Actually, those rocks tell a lot about the history of the universe. Well, the great thing about the meteorites in particular is they're the scrap heap of the solar system. Now, I grew up in America after World War II when they were building lots of houses, and I was in one of these housing tracts where they were building many new houses. And you could go as a kid into the back garden and find out in the scrap heap what was going on inside the house. You'd say, oh, they have purple tile in this house, they have wood paneling in that house. The scrap heap of the solar system are these meteorites. By looking at what's in here, we can figure out what is inside the planets. For instance, look at these large iron meteorites. They're iron and nickel and lumps of sulfide. And that tells us that the core of the Earth is probably made out of the same material, iron and nickel and sulfides. And the iron and nickel you could have guessed from the density, but the sulfide you wouldn't have known about, except that we have the sulfides here in the meteorites. Is there any moment that, let's say, the idea of the universe being so old interfered with your belief in the creation of the universe? Now, people wonder about, you know, you've got the Bible that says the world is six million years old. People tell me, you've got the Bible that says the world is 6,000 years old. How can I believe in meteorites that are billions of years old? Number one, the Bible doesn't say that. Number two, the Bible is a book about God, not about science. And we've always understood that the Bible has to be understood in a symbolic way in many different levels because there aren't any words that are capable of describing God any more than there are words capable of describing love. That's why we write poetry about love. That's why we write poetry about God. The universe tells me about the Creator, but I'm only going to get the truth about the Creator if I'm not afraid of the truth that the universe tells me. And the universe is telling me these rocks are four and a half billion years old. Incidentally, um, I'm not just me saying this, Pope Pius XII talks about meteorites being billions of years old back in the 1950s. Uh, Thomas Aquinas, writing about it in the Middle Ages, talks about the universe as being very different from the literal form of the Bible. In fact, St. Augustine, in the year 400, writes a book on the literal interpretation of Genesis. That's the title of the book. And he says, if you hear a, uh, and he says, if you hear a Christian talking nonsense about the universe because they think that's how you interpret Genesis, you're doing a scandal to the Bible and a scandal to our religion because you're making people think that we believe stupid things, especially things that science has told us otherwise. Of course, the science of his day was completely different from the science of our day, and the science a thousand years from now, I hope, will be different yet again. But do the meteorites learn you something about God? The meteorites do teach me this about God. First of all, he's very logical. He operates by his own rules. And yet, with these simple rules, he can come up with things of incredible complexity. So that we've got meteorites here that, let me show you. If I can, oh. if I can open this up. You've got meteorites here that are a collection of different kinds of materials that have been broken up and reassembled in a way that you wouldn't have expected simply thinking through logic. But once you see it, you can understand the logic of how they were broken up and reassembled. 
But the other thing it tells me about creation is, at the end of the day, though I can logically explain this meteorite or that one or that one, what surprises me is that they're also beautiful. And the laws that explain how they were made are beautiful. This is a creator who both loves logic and reason and the rules that he's invented, but enjoys creating beauty at the same time that he's creating a universe. But then he becomes the large aesthetic guy. And this means that at the basis of the universe is not only the reason of the universe, but a sense of beauty and a sense of passion for beauty, which means ultimately the base of everything is a sense of love. That this is a universe based on elegance, based on truth, based on love. And love is not love if it's based on a lie. Love is not love if there isn't reason behind it. I mean, the heart has reasons that reason doesn't know, but they are reasons. It's this marvelous mixture that you find at every level of human existence, whether it's my relationship with my family and my friends, my relationship with pieces of art, or my relationship with the way the universe works. Could you say that the creator is in the complexity, in the understanding of this complexity? The beautiful thing about this creator is he loves complexity, but it's not complexity for its own sake. It's complexity that follows logically. Just as a well-written story will have more and more complicated things happening out of what started out to be a very simple premise, and then you realize suddenly the implications of that premise. I think that reflects the way that we experience life, and it reflects the way that we experience the universe. Now, if you want to be an atheist and you want to say there's no God, you can do that and you can see the entire universe as the result of random collections of materials and, and random applications of laws that exist for reasons we don't know. But if you start with the belief that you're seeing here the action of a God who is outside of nature but expressing himself in nature, then it's like seeing the personality of Shakespeare in a play of Shakespeare. Uh, the personality of Michelangelo in the paintings of the sculpture of Michelangelo. You learn the personality of God by seeing how God created. There are a lot of ways he could have made the universe. I'm delighted he made it this way. And if you look as a scientist like this? As a scientist, I keep discovering new things to learn. Like Every time I look at one of these meteorites, I'll say, oh, there's a wonderful collection of iron, and this particular one is a mesosiderite, iron and basaltic material. Now, when you make basalts, generally it's at the top of the planet, and the iron goes to the bottom. How are they mixed together? And that was the first mystery. The second mystery is, wait a minute, I can now see there's a different piece there than there than there. How did it happen that not only you had this mixing, but you had this mixing more and more times? And then you ask, how did it happen that the mixing occurred, but completely so that there's no gaps between the different colored pieces here? And the longer you look, the more you see and the more questions that come out of it. Science is not about answering questions. Science is about becoming aware of the questions you could have been asking all along. If you look at those things, and maybe you can just show us a little bit around. Um, actually, it's interesting because um, the universe is filled with gas, and this is all very solid now. Right. <clears throat> Let's take a look at some of these. These are ordinary chondrites, and you pull out the, the drawer, you can see some of the material here. Under this magnifying glass, you can see little, little droplets, frozen droplets of rock. How were these made? There are more theories than there are theorists. We don't know yet. Uh, it may be a shock wave through the early cloud of gas and dust that melts the dust into little balls. It could be a flare from the sun as it was growing. It could be when there were impacts between solid rocks, these were splashes that dropped out. Whatever it is, these little droplets form the basis of most of these meteorites, especially this one and this one. And yet, when you look carefully at this meteorite, you don't see droplets. You see it's incredibly tightly packed together. And when you measure the porosity, you actually use the equipment in our lab to measure how much pore space is in here. The only pore space you see are cracks that occurred after it was solidified into a rock. So the question then comes up, how did this come to be a rock? 
If the solar system is formed out of a cloud of the gas and dust swirling around, and we see these clouds, we see them in, in the Hubble telescope, and we see these little droplets formed presumably in that cloud with a lot of dust around it, why is it we don't have interstellar dust bunnies, you know, just large collections of dust like you'd find under your bed? But instead, it's all tightly compacted into a rock like this. How did that happen? We don't know. You would like to know. <clears throat> I would like to know how it happened, and I'd also like to know why it is that a rock like this, which comes, we're pretty sure, from the inner part of the asteroid belt, has a density of 5 or 10 percent just due to the cracks. But as I go outward into the outer solar system, I have these carbonaceous meteorites that have a density here with, which shows that it's, this is about 20 percent empty pore space. You wouldn't know what to look like it, but, but you know, <coughs> try it again. This is 20 percent empty space, pore space. You wouldn't know it to look at it. It looks like a solid rock, but it's actually 20 percent empty. The rock here in the bottle, the one that's full of water and carbon material, maybe from a comet, this is 35 to 40 percent empty space. I mean, a bucket of sand at the beach is 50 percent empty space. This is almost as porous as a bucket of sand. Why is it that these from the outer part of the solar system are very porous, and these from the inner part of the solar system are very compacted? It's telling us something about how the planets were formed. We're not quite sure what yet. What is your deepest motivation to wanting to know actually what happened? It's funny, the the day-to-day -day motivation that gets me into the lab to work with it is simply the joy of touching pieces of outer space and reminding myself that the universe is bigger than what's here on Earth, it's bigger than what's for lunch. I just love interacting with the bigger universe. But as I interact, suddenly these questions come up into my head. Where did that come from? Where did that come from? And, and it's a hunger. It's a curiosity. It's the same curiosity that makes me look at a, a tray of chocolates and I, I wonder what that tastes like. And now I know. Well, I wonder if the one next to it tastes the same way. It's a hunger that can never be satisfied. Is it also the almost, let's say, childish why? There is a certain childlike wonder that you come with this. Um, part of it is like the little kid who always asks why, and after you get the next question, well, why, why is the sky blue? Well, why does it have air? Well, why does there light? Well, why does it work like this? But beyond that, as you get older, I think there's also the desire to tell the story. It's not enough to ask the questions, even though I say ultimately the goal of science is to ask the questions. But to come up with a story that will allow me to put these questions together and then to tell my friends who are also in the field. That's why we have meetings every year where we all get together and share the story of what we learned since the last time we met. And I want to hear their stories and they want to hear mine. Uh, the most important thing I learned as a scientist is to choose a field where there are other people in it who you like hanging out with. There are some scientists who everybody else in the field is their enemy and they've got to show them up. I've been in fields like that. That's not fun. Science is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be the love and the joy that makes you want to go down to the lab in the morning and do the frankly tedious work that you do every day to get one more data point but on one more chart so that at the end of the year you've got 365 data points and you can begin to see a pattern. And then you've got a story you can tell. Can you show you also have pieces of Mars and movement? We were talking about how meteorites are four and a half billion years old, and you can tell from the radioactive elements in all of these meteorites, all of them are as old as the solar system, four and a half billion years. That means nothing happened in the parent body that they came from. They never melted, they never froze, the, the, the radioactive elements were never released from their crystals and reacrylated. Try again. The radioactive elements were never released from their crystals and re-equilibrated. But there are some rocks that are meteorites that that has happened to. If you look here, we've got three different sets of meteorites. Now these are basalts. These are meteorites that melted, came to the top of their planet, and froze again. 
Uh, for a lot of reasons, we think that Vesta is what remains of the parent that made these basaltic meteorites. Vesta is a little asteroid. It's about 400 kilometers across. And these meteorites are four and a half billion years old, as old as all the other meteorites. The smaller the body, the faster it cools off. But when you come down here, these meteorites are only three and a half billion years old. They're younger. And they have a chemistry which is exactly the same as this piece of lunar rock that the Apollo 17 astronauts brought back. So we know that these meteorites that, that fell in North Africa are actually pieces that have been chipped off the moon. The moon is bigger than any asteroid. The moon could hold on to its heat for a billion years. And then you look at these three meteorites. All of them basalts, all of them melted, all of them with an age of less than one billion years. What's more, where all of these other meteorites are full of metallic iron, here the minerals are full of iron that's been completely rusted, completely oxidized, like they were made on a planet bigger than the moon so it could hold on to its heat, and with an atmosphere that even includes carbon dioxide. And you think, what body in the universe fits all of that? Well, Mars is the only one that fits, but can you really get one of these off of Mars? Great debates on this for 10 years. Then somebody found in one of these meteorites a crack. And where it cracked, you know, probably being launched off the surface, the rock melted and then froze. And when it froze, it captured tiny bubbles of air, air from the atmosphere of wherever it came from. And you carve around a bubble, you put it into a mass spectrometer, total vacuum, you melt the rock and the bubble bursts, all the air from the bubble goes down the mass spectrometer, you add up every atom, you can measure the exact abundance and the exact isotopes and the complete composition of that bubble of air. It exactly matches the atmosphere of Mars. And the atmosphere of Mars is different from any other planet's atmosphere for a lot of reasons. So we're convinced you know, either these guys came from Mars or they came from another planet exactly like Mars that we haven't found yet. And, you know, I don't think the odds of that are very high. So we have here, not just pieces of outer space, but pieces of another planet. How can you not be thrilled by that? You tell us as a, as a, a funny story. It, it, it is. All of science is a story. All of religion is a story. All of life is a story. I mean, I got into the field because I loved reading science fiction. To me, planets are places where people have adventures. And I haven't been to Mars. I probably will never get there but I can already start to have the adventure of knowing what Mars is like. Would you like to be there? I would never say no to the chance of going to Mars or any place else. On the other hand, I really, really want to know, did life originate on Mars? And I'm afraid as soon as you sent a human being there, we're going to leak E. coli all over the place and contaminate the place. So at the moment, it's safer to send a robot there. But someday, someday. I've been to Antarctica. And that was as close as I'll probably ever get to being on another planet. It was really hard. I was happy to leave after two months of living on the ice. But I'm so glad I went. And it was a great story. It was a great adventure.
Now, this is an interesting meteorite. It's an ordinary chondrite, but it's a piece that can show you both the outside. This is the fusion crust where it came barreling through the atmosphere and the outer parts were melted away, leaving this thin bit of, of black rock. You can see how thin it is because on the inside, you've got the gray material that's been untouched by the heat. The heat was all boiled away when the outer part of the rock was boiled away. Still, you can also see the fine cracks and little bits of rust because terrestrial air has come in and rusted the metal along the cracks. And then you see a, a boundary here where two different pieces of rock were mushed together back in the parent asteroid, back, you know, a few million years ago, many billions of years after the rock itself was formed as rock. As a meteorite, it's fascinating because all meteorites are fascinating and it's beautiful, but it's an ordinary meteorite. It's not a particularly unusual type. This particular one, though, has a tremendous value among collectors simply because it fell in Honolulu. And it's the only meteorite that we have that's come from the state of Hawaii. And there are going to be collectors out there who want a meteorite from every state and they'll pay tremendous prices for, you know, a meteorite that happened to fall in Hawaii. Collectors are strange that way, but thankfully there are collectors because otherwise we wouldn't have the samples, we wouldn't have the people who can make a living collecting meteorites from all around the world. So you have another cool thing. Yeah. So we've got another cool thing that I love to show people, which is these two samples of a meteorite type called a palisite. And the great thing, of course, is you can see the light coming through the peridot, through the olivine crystals. Scientifically, what's interesting is that both the metal and the olivine were liquid and crystallized together. And yet the olivine is half the density of the metal. How come they didn't separate? How come the metal didn't all go to the bottom and the olivine bubble up to the top? The only explanation is that this happened inside a body where the gravity was very, very low, like inside a very small asteroid. Uh, this particular one is fun because this one fell in Argentina, and this was a sample that we showed Pope Francis when he visited the lab. It's great having the popes here because, you know, they come with their own white lab coats. <laughs> can, you, can you say that sentence one more time? It, it's great having the popes here, of course, because they come with their own white lab coats. If you want, I can even wear Bob's lab coat while I'm saying that. But, um, <laughs> yeah, I don't that's know. That's nice. That's nice. nice. Okay. okay. Uh, I want to take a close up of. Oh, okay, sure. Can you can you put uh, uh, the the the, an angle the light on again, off and on? Oh, okay, so. Ja, zeker, zeker. Ik denk dat je gewoon uh, een beetje. Beetje... Nou, ik heb nu gewoon het, uh, het steentje zo. Ah ja. The value of the meteorite figuring a density. All right, yeah. Yes, of course. No, yeah. So, uh, I don't know if brother guy has described the uh, the glass beads that. Uh, uh, well, this this is what we do now instead of glass beads. All right. Can you uh, zoom in on it? Okay. 